I'm just going to record to my computer because maybe it'll save some bandwidth and I won't cut out on you guys. Okay, so I am going to sh okay, should you see my screen now? I'm going to hit the present mode. Okay, I can see Jayesh and Jody. Can you see my screen? Okay, perfect. So the way that I always go through papers with my students is... Actually, it went away. Oh, strange. Okay, stand by. Let me try that again. Oh, I want to present. Maybe if I do this. All right, we'll try that again. All right, now can you see it? Actually, I can't see anybody. Okay, you're nodding your heads. Good. All right. So the way that I tend to go through papers, and I, I tell my students that you can you can more or less pick out the most important pieces of a paper in five minutes if you know how to do it. And that's because papers are always arranged in the, in the same way. They follow the order of an introduction, which motivates the, the work and states what's been done and the gap in knowledge, and then the objectives or the research questions, hypotheses, how they did the work, their, their major findings and the implications of those findings. So the first thing I always do when reviewing a paper with the group is just go through those quickly. And then for the purpose of this, we'll, we'll have some, some more specific questions I think that we could discuss with regards to our project and whether or not we are pursuing convergence research as defined in this paper and uh, some, other, some other things. So the, the main purpose of this paper is to define convergence research and motivate convergence research. And um, essentially convergence research is it's problem focused, it's solution oriented, the efforts to solve problems cut across disciplinary boundaries and truly integrate disciplinary, um, integrate different disciplines. And so this was one of the figures where it's generally inspired by the need to address a specific challenge or opportunity, whether it arises from deep scientific questions or pressing societal needs, and then research that involves deep integration across disciplines. So that's how they define convergence research. And the, the importance of this is that when we're tackling societal problems, societal problems are almost always fundamentally multidisciplinary, multidimensional problems. And so to tackle them, we do need to break down disciplinary silos and sector silos and figure out how to integrate our knowledge, share our knowledge, and work together. So when we're thinking about this overarching goal of, of, um, of promoting collective well-being, like what is collective well-being? And in terms of this paper, they define it as vitality, health and positive functioning of communities, opportunity, so we can think of that as life goals, financial stability, so economics, of course, comes in there, connectedness, community support, social interdependence, contribution, meaning, purpose, engagement and belonging, so that sense of community, that sense of feeling like you belong here and that you're connected to this place and connected with the people that live here, um, and inspiration, motivation, and hopeful activities. And some of the things that certainly influence or um, prevent us from, from having this collective well-being are shocks and stresses, right? So shocks are things like pandemics <laughs> or flooding or earthquakes or severe storms. And, um, and you know, the, this diagram here, and then stresses, I kind of think of stresses as, as many of these underlying root causes. So stresses are things like climate change is an ongoing stress, environmental degradation, hazard exposure, uh, population growth into hazardous areas, land use planning, poverty and economic inequality, social injustice. These are stresses that impact our community's ability to promote collective well-being. When you combine these underlying stresses with a shock, is where there's a high potential for disaster losses. And so when we're, we're thinking about, about disaster loss, traditionally it's thought about as in terms of um, deaths and injury and then damage or, or loss of property. So if we really truly want to promote collective well-being as hazard scientists, we can't just say, okay, we need to harden infrastructure and we need to tell people to prepare because we're, we're not taking into account some of these underlying causes. 
of what, what compromises our ability to reduce disaster losses and to promote collective well-being. So I really liked this figure in the paper because I thought it, it sums that idea up really well. So that's the importance. And their methods, well, there really weren't methods to this paper, right? Because it was more of a review paper. But if anything, I think their, their definition of integration, conceptual integration was really useful for me. I, you know, you hear the words, it's, it's multidisciplinary, it's interdisciplinary, it's transdisciplinary. And I always have to Google them to figure out what, like how they're different, <laughs> right? Am I using the right one? And so I really liked how they, how they uh, explain increasing conceptual integration kind of on this, on this scale with disciplinarity to multidisciplinarity. And this is really where you've got disciplines working maybe together, but they're still really focused on like, I'll do this part and you do that part and then we'll, we'll talk at the end type thing. And I really do think that what we have developed falls very strongly in this interdisciplinary field integrating, truly integrating information, data, methods, tools, and concepts um, to focus on complex questions, problem, problems, etc. So I think we're here, and one of the questions I have, and I don't know the answer to, and maybe we can discuss it today, is how to reach transdisciplinarity. Is it an outcome of interdisciplinary research, or is it something that we can integrate in what we do early on to ensure that we are reaching this, this transdisciplinary level. So I'll just give you a minute to read through these top two so that you can have those in your head. So the, the construct of transdisciplinarity goes beyond interdisciplinary combinations of existing approaches to foster new world views or domains. So it doesn't mean that all research, even interdisciplinary research, will not reach this level of transdisciplinarity. And whether or not we do, whether or not we foster new world views or domains is, is to be seen. But I think it's something that we should, we should have in mind and tr strive toward. So the, the major findings of the work, I think like the take home message is that there is a framework and there are resources for advancing this idea of convergent research. And where we are in this loop of, okay, identifying researchers. We did that, right? We've got a gr good group of folks in our proposal educating and training researchers, and then setting a convergence research agenda, connecting researchers and coordinating diverse teams, funding convergent research, and the loop continues. So certainly our efforts over the last few months have identified a set of researchers. We've identified a convergent research agenda as well, right? But we kind of skipped over this step in that planning grant, which is educating and training researchers. And so this idea of emerging researchers, folks that are coming into the idea of disaster resilience or, or um, community disaster resilience from social sciences or humanities or economics or math, right? So these different fields that are coming into this that may not have, uh, may not be steeped in traditional hazard training, right? But these folks are, are critical to to pursuing this idea of interdisciplinarity. And so what I really wanna do over these next few months while we wait to hear that we're definitely gonna get that grant funded, fingers crossed, right? Is to work together to, to pursue this education and training so that when we get that funding, that funding and, and pursue the full grant, that we can set an even more specific and fundable research agenda, right? So, um, the big implications, so the, again, so we went through the purpose, um, the major find, the methods, the major findings, and thinking about this, these big picture implications, it's really about, of this particular paper, it's really about training and fostering those interdisciplinary teams so that we can address social, economic, environmental, and technical grant challenges. 
specifically with respect to disaster risk reduction and collective well-being. And so these two, I just kind of put together these two figures from the paper that we are certainly in the interdisciplinary fields or approach at this point. And we are focusing on some of those underlying root causes. We're, we're, we're trying to identify those through our approach. So, oh, I also wanted to point out that, and this is on your own time, if you have a chance that the, the folks that wrote this paper also have the Converge Research Center, and they have a bunch of resources specifically for us, for our group of emerging scientists that you could go through. There's, I think, four training modules, there's briefing sheets, and uh, so that's just something to be aware of, and I'll, I can pop that link into the chat box in a little bit. So our project, what are we doing? Just to remind ourselves where we fit into that, that framework. Our, our title is Modeling Resilience Through a Community Lens, Discovering Data, Creating Tools, and Connecting People Who Make Resilience Possible. And the two objectives that we had in our project summary, what are the social, human, economic, natural, and physical conditions that contribute to our community's potential for disaster loss, as well as its mitigation response and recovery capacity. And the other objective is to address how our stakeholders currently collaborate and are coordinating in disaster resilience efforts and the strengths and weakness of these network ties. And so that's really what we're focusing on. And to focus on this first one, we are approaching this with a capitals approach where we use and assess, we work with the community, we bring people together through workshops with diverse knowledge and we think about how do we define social capital, economic capital, human capital, physical capital, and natural capital for our society. There's a lot of research and published papers out there on creating these resilience indices, but very few, I think only one or two of them have actually worked within the community itself to say, well, who are we? What variables define us? What data sets are locally available to address these and try to measure them? And that's what we're trying to do is bring in that community knowledge. For example, when we're thinking about human capital, which in essence is the ability for a person to, to maintain employment, to, to uh, support their family, right? I think a very important data set that's going to come into that, of course, is the Alice Report and the uh, community assessment that the United Way did, right? And so to make this even more novel and again, more interdisciplinary, so coming at it from this capitalist approach is really really uh, an economics approach in essence, but by integrating that capital's approach with another disaster framework, the disaster impacts model allows us to really integrate those two frameworks, including, so we've got two theoretical frameworks there, and then we have the national disaster recovery framework, which is more of a, an applied framework from FEMA. So we're basically trying to integrate all of these through active engagement with the community to better understand where we are in terms of Ada and Canyon County and with respect to those underlying shocks and stresses and our ability to, to be resilient to the potential for future disasters or our current disaster, right? And I'm really excited about this too because I think we will, when if we are able to get the funding and do this work, we'll really have a strong assessment of how COVID has impacted our social structures and some of the conditions, these pre-existing conditions or those underlying stresses that magnified the negative impacts of COVID for certain communities. So that's, um, that's my summary of the paper. And these are the questions that I came up with for our discussion. How does what we are proposing fall under the idea of convergence research? What aspects of our proposed work could be strengthened to promote convergence research? And these are things I think we should keep in mind throughout these next few months as we're going through all of, all of the literature and talking about how to strengthen our approach. How could it be strengthened to promote convergence research? Is our research interdisciplinary? I think so. How can we reach transdisciplinary results? I, I don't know. Again, something that we probably are going to focus on over the next few months. And the, the paper also suggests that research teams include diverse perspectives from traditionally marginalized groups and communities to holistically address the idea of collective well-being. Are we doing this? How we are to some extent, right? But we could be doing better. So 
So how can we bring in more diverse perspectives from our community to make sure that we are, are really reaching all people? And then, uh, yeah, finally, how do we increase diversity and representation for marginalized groups and communities? So I'm just gonna open it up for a discussion. I don't know if you guys, let's see, maybe, maybe the easiest thing to do, I'll just put these in the chat box because I'd like for us all to see each other and then we'll, how do I stop, stop sharing? And I'll just copy and paste these questions into the chat box. Oh, thank you, Kristen. And Jody, I don't know, did Jody already take off? Yeah, she, she added her notes to the Google Doc, though, so. Perfect. Yeah, I, exactly. So she's got her notes in the Google Doc. Yeah. So here's the questions. I said I'm coming up and finding another way, so. Um, I can start just by letting you know what Jody said. She says that in response to your first two bullets, yes, this is convergence research, and she thinks that so far we've done a good job at identifying researchers to make sure that we have diverse disciplines and we're truly trying to integrate them, and that we are in phase two, which is educating and training researchers. So I agree. And she feels like she's in a situation that she doesn't know what you, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and that's a really good point, right? And so that's the purpose of, of reading through these papers together. Yeah, I'll just open it up to you guys. Let's have a discussion. Brittany, I have a quick point on one of the things you mentioned earlier, which is we're at that stage where we're trying to uh, reach to transdisciplinarity from interdisciplinarity. I think that we might be underselling ourselves because if I remember, uh, there was the wildfire workshop that uh, the Institute did recently, which I was planning on attending. But you know, events like those uh, are essentially targeted to educating uh, folks from a wide different uh, group of disciplines, right? So I think in some sense, you know, our Institute is uh, sort of doing that already, maybe it's not directly reflected on our proposal or pre-proposal at this point, but we've done a good job of sort of getting inputs from a wide variety of stakeholders. So I think that's a good sign of us kind of, you know, trying to go to transdisciplinarity from interdisciplinarity, if you will. Yeah, thank you. And maybe the model of, of how we're engaging community stakeholders because I mean especially for this type of call like it was required right so are we doing it to check a box no right so that's that's the fundamental reason that the HCRI exists is to provide a platform so that we can connect with our stakeholders from the very beginning develop those relationships and better understand our society's needs work together share knowledge co-produce knowledge all of that so that's at the core of who we are and what we want to do right so I think we, you know, we'll, we'll work our whole careers to build that network and still not reach everybody, but, but that is very, very important to this proposal, but in general to the Institute. One thing that I've been thinking a lot about is like who we have in the room. And I think so far we have a really great group of people, but there probably are others that are not here yet. Um, and so I don't know how do, how do we identify those people? Um, because obviously we know who we know right now. So how do we think about who else to incorporate? Um, and I'd love to hear anybody else's ideas on that. Um, I also think in this project, I think having our community stakeholders is, is super important and potentially having some more of those in like leadership positions for this project is gonna be uh, in, important um, as well, so some things I've been thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go to that point of who is not in the room and how do we how do we bring them in? So who are some communities that we have not reached out to yet or have not been able to effectively bring into the group? 
I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I think we don't know what we don't know. Um, I do have, just to back up a second, I have some thoughts yeah. on transdisciplinary versus interdisciplinary and how that kind of plays out in nonprofit organizations and things where we're very, very siloed, but we come together to share data and to share the research, but where we stop playing together is when we implement mm -hmm. action plans and the, those kinds of things. That's done pretty much siloed. And I think the idea of transdisciplinary work is when those action plans are actually aligned and coordinated versus mm -hmm. done in silos. So that's where I see it in the work that I do. And I don't know if that brings a different perspective to what you guys are seeing in actual academia and research, but that's what I see in groups that are collaborating throughout the Treasure Valley right now. Yeah, that's a really good point, Sam. Do you, Sam, do you have any thoughts on what leads to that? Is it just like the structures in place currently, or do you have any thoughts on kind of what, how you could change that? <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> but I think uh, one of the things that is the biggest concern strength in implementation plans not being more aligned is um, resource sources, so funding sources. They're very much siloed and dictated by stringent boundaries, um, especially in nonprofit work and in, in state work, the health departments and education departments. And if those funding streams were able to commingle a little bit more, then I think we would get a little bit more commingling. Um, in the actual implementation and disciplinary and transdisciplinary work. Does anybody have any insight into how that translates between municipalities as well? Because I know, well, I'm not a public policy person, but from my understanding, if, if you want to, cities, for example, compete for funding for projects, Right, and so is some of the work that's siloed via jurisdictions a result of not a clear way to fund across jurisdictions? Does that make sense? Well, there's not a clear way to fund um, big projects that span multiple jurisdictions. That's always been the huge challenge. And you can see that just when you look at city plans for their impact zones. And for example, Meridian and CUNA were involved in a, I think a 10 year court battle over an impact zone where the two of them were butting up against each other and saying that they had rights to property. So when you see just the fight over rights to where the impact zones are, and then you start talking about complex projects that cross multiple jurisdictions with overla overlapping election cycles, you can create environments that are extremely complex um, you know, Eagle could have signed on to something two years ago with the city of Boise, but they had a sea change in their uh, city council and with their mayor and is no longer interested in partnering with the city of Boise. So when you talk about some water quality issues and other things, you get into some really complex dynamics where it's important for a neutral party to be able to come in and really make the case why both jurisdictions are 100% benefiting from this and it isn't politics. And even then, I'm not sure if it can, if you can cross the hoop with some folks, cross the plane. I don't know what I'm saying. No, that makes sense. That helps a lot. No, it's, that's very true, Matt. Um, in the health sector, they're trying to create community funds in a lot of places based on collaborative multidisciplinary collaborations um, to help kind of address some of those funding issues and they've worked well in some areas and not in others but um, that's also something that I'm working with Sarah Dr. Taves on in the Western Idaho Community Health Collaborative we're working with the master's student to kind of do a little bit of a mini research project on that and what best practices when creating a, a community fund toward something that addresses more social determinants of health and I would say there are examples of where cross collaboration has worked. I mean, the mini Cassia consolidated school district is one of those areas where it's worked. Often it takes them three or four times to pass a levy, but that's because they have to 
get every community to buy into it and in getting the communities to buy into it, all the communities see improvements to their district. So, but there are few of those in the state that are really operating highly. Uh, what have they done to increase buy-in? Do you know for the different communities, like for the ones that have been successful? So what they end up doing is they end up uh, coming up with areas of improvement that each community needs. And so rather than having, let's say that, you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking about the towns, there's no real huge booming towns in the Minicasha school district, but you have schools that, that maybe the roof was leaking so bad that that, that whole school needed repaired. And so they would take it to a levy and the other towns would be like, go pound sand. We're not interested in that. So they would come back to the table and come up with a, with a levy that actually put improvements into each one of the communities and then they could get stuff passed. But what that has created is a much more collaborative um, process, except for it takes, you know, three times as long as it would in a single school district that could have just done it themselves. And that harm done is amplified over the years as students are working in poor schools or everything else. So they've started to um, just do that right out of the gate instead of, you know, trying three or five times to get the right mix. I kind of feel like that's, this idea is currently a weakness in our project. Like we, we want to model resilience for our region and we want to create a user-friendly dashboard, some sort of tool that municipalities can use to justify resource allocation to address underlying stresses right but how that's really going to be operationalized how it's really going to be used and can it be used to promote that more collaborative type of effort is is to me like the biggest weakness in our project right now and and maybe maybe that means that we need to have some more policy folks at the table to help us understand not only the policies and, and the, the way that municipal, municipalities interact with each other, because it's just beyond me. I don't, I just don't understand it, right? I mean, but, um, but lots of people do. And so if we really want this to be a tool that's actually going to be used and used in a way that fosters that collaboration and working across jurisdictions to promote collective well-being that I feel like that's that's something we don't have um, we could bring more people to the table with that with that expertise and certainly having Matt at the table is critical to bring in that perspective right and I really appreciate you being here today Matt thank you um, but yeah maybe maybe we could think about who else could come into this project to help us really facilitate that end piece of this yeah, one of the groups that, and I don't know if they'd be able to just because they are a federally funded group, but Compass, having someone who's really um, involved in a lot of the research there at Compass might be really beneficial to this group. They work with every discipline, um, jurisdiction, sorry. Yeah. And they're federally required given the size of our valley. So they are, I think they would be able to come to the table for sure. Um, again, their emphasis, though, is largely in the transportation infrastructure, so it really depends on what discipline you're looking for as well. But there are a number of people of a compass, as Samantha said, that would be really great additives to this. Yeah, transportation and land use. So I think that land use bit is probably what would really be important and valuable to this group. Yeah. Yeah, Lisa, Lisa Itkinen is on our HCRI advisory board, and she's Compass is a collaborator on this project, but we haven't, I don't think that we've been working with them at the, at the level that we, we really could be. So that's a great point. Thanks. You know, there may be some options, like just let's use the CWI taxing district as an example. Um, they've multiple times tried to put levies and bonds on the ballot and Ada County has passed it. Canyon County has thwarted it and the end result is nobody then benefits from it. And so the, the levy, which was a 50 plus one lost by 140 votes, 
the bond, which would have actually built a facility in Boise. So there would have been a facility in Nampa and Boise failed like 3%. So they had 63 out of a 66% supermajority. So, but the reason I bring that one up is because in this valley, it's like a tale of two worlds. And so thinking specifically about who should we be bringing in from the Western edges of the valley to have this larger conversation is really critical because they often from a, from a collaborative perspective are the folks who feel like they were left out of the table in the first place and they have resentment to the capital city and the big county. So it, it would be an interesting piece to see if there's some county commissioners over there or some other folks that might have interest in, in the larger piece. Do you have any contacts over there or ideas of people that would be good to, or know someone who would know? <laughs> Trish Nelson uh, is a, you know, one person who really knows the area and is preparing to retire is Commissioner Dale. Um, he's a county commissioner for Canyon County. He was the longtime mayor of Nampa before he lost in a, like a, like a one-off Tea Party election. So, you know, and now he's commissioner. He's getting ready to retire. He has not demonstrated, in my opinion, the best uh, judgment on the COVID front, but this is a good place for him to bring the political complications that he was considering in you know, voting against a mask mandate and some of the other things on Southwest District Health. But he's really smart. I think he's really thoughtful and I think he has a lot of history with trying to collaborate across the board. So I can send, um, I can send the group his contact information then whoever wants to reach out to him might benefit. I mean, then I was also yeah. going to say maybe um, the Canyon County planner Trish Nelson is very, very smart, works really well in with all of the different entities in Canyon County. Um, so she may be a good one too, if they're not, you know, bandwidth is always a big issue for people who are kind of well, running she's commissions. The and she's, she's a senior personnel. She, she actually just emailed me this morning. She has a, a hearing about an, a yoga studio or something that conflicted. So she was disappointed she couldn't make it, but, but you're right. She is, she has been amazing and really excited about this work. And, um, you know, she has said many times that she's bringing those communities to this table. She's going to make sure that the communities in Canyon County are a part of this. So I'm really excited that she's a part of this already. Yeah, I think one of the things that I think we discussed earlier that uh, maybe gets at the same thing we're talking about here is this sort of with Canyon County included is we're trying to get at the rural aspects as well as the urban side. So from my perspective, we got to be careful that, you know, we're trying to tap what that is from my side of things that would include the, you know, the environmental aspects of things that, that I believe are part of what we're looking at in terms of resilience, but there's also the ag side, water side, all those things from the, from the rural side that we somehow have to, tap and make sure we're getting that included as opposed to just have it dominated by, for lack of a better term, the urban aspects uh, and just the, the people side. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important because if we want to expand this work, which is the idea, right, that we, we learn how to do this and then we expand it to other communities across Idaho and, and potentially beyond. And so if we're not including the rural communities in a, in a real and meaningful way in this, we're going to miss that opportunity to understand the differences and the different ways that we address problems. And, and right, and the, and the rural side, it seems like, especially in, the, in this valley, are the ones under pressure and under change. And so that, that is a, a potential learning opportunity and getting those folks involved and then having the engagement about those those natural resource aspects as well as those uh, rural capacity that we need to kind of evaluate and make sure we're making part of our discussion. Uh, this is Nate. Um, what about if we're looking at the urban aspect along with the rural aspect? 
<clears throat> Simplot uh, should be a very good resource to reach out to. Um, they have, it's not just specifically farming uh, inside that company. It's um, environmentalists, it's, it's geography, you know, or um, uh, climatologists, you know, they, they look at all that aspect of it. So, you know, to reach out to them and maybe have them join and, and give their perspective on what they see, especially on the urban side, it's what we're trying to reach out to, uh, might be a uh, good resource to have. Hey, do you have any contacts with that you, that you know there? I do have a contact. I haven't spoke to her in a while, but um, I can reach out and see what, um, what they can, if they have the availability or, um, um, or I can give them Brittany's uh, information to contact. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I think I think the local businesses are are kind of a, a group of people that we haven't um, maybe in, incorporated as much as we could be. So that's a really good point. Yeah, that's definitely a group that we we need to build up. We especially some of the local businesses. We do have representation from Suez Water and Idaho Power. And uh, but yeah, I think Simplot, Hewlett Packard, Micron, some of those bigger Albertsons, those bigger companies, but also bringing in some of the smaller businesses and um, working with them as well to understand their perspectives. And especially, I guess by the time we do this research post pandemic, you know, I think everybody has a better idea from a business continuity standpoint of, of what what made them resilient resilient to to the impacts of this particular disaster and what they might need to do in the future to become more resilient. So I think bringing their their experiences and their perspectives to the table is going to be really critical. And and maybe we reach them through the chamber. I I'm not sure, but but if anybody has contacts, like as we're going through here, you're like, oh, you should talk to this person, or hey, maybe that person. Let's just compile those so that I can start reaching out to them slowly over time and building those relationships. With Simplot, I I met with their sustainability director, who we actually served on the mayor transition team together. I Remember that way. And for some reason, her name is just falling out of my head this morning. But she's wonderful. And she, I invited her to be a part of this, but she didn't have the bandwidth. But that means that we probably need to find somebody else. It's some plot. And I, I could reach out to her again and see if there's somebody else that, that might be able to come to the table. Good. You could have somebody from the Water Users Association as well. I don't know if you mm -hmm. already do, but I could put a couple um, mm -hmm. names out. Only because of the importance of the New York Canal as it stretches the entire length of the valley and splits into so many different canal and irrigation districts that, you know, when we talk about particularly what Greg was talking about with regard to water quality, yeah. having, you know, Paul, who's the executive director of the water users, might be the best central contact instead of adding, you know, 50 different canal district people onto it. And the canal district folks can be a little bit knee jerky. Uh, so the water users might be a, might be a good steering component. Yeah, thank you. I, earlier, I shared this document that Carson's keeping notes in. So that's a nice place if you uh, want want to write down some names while you're thinking about them. I'll share it again just so you have it. It's in our shared civic drive. You should all have access to that now, but if you don't, you can grab it. So feel free to add some names there. Okay. Let me revisit our questions here. What about bringing, bringing some of our more marginalized or traditionally underrepresented groups to the table? The, I, I reached out to Idaho Immigration Justice and they they were interested in what we were doing but don't have the capacity to get involved without us paying them to do so which i think that's a 
you know, that's something that we really need to pay attention to. And the nature of this grant allows us to give several awards to those, those folks. So, which is really amazing, right? So I'm hoping that they'll be able to engage if we get the full project funded. But who else are we missing that might represent those groups or serve those groups that we should be bringing to the table? Community Council of Idaho. They do a lot of work from Migrant Seasonal Head Start to even um, utilities support and housing support and things like that. Um, focused on those migrant workers, which mm. would be a really good thing to have. I know uh, in other collaborations that I've worked with, bringing in a community voice is something everyone wants, but it's really hard to do without stipending them or at least giving them something to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Some incentive to be there. Yeah. If you have some contacts there or want to introduce me to somebody that you know, and that's always a really good, just I found in networking that if, if somebody can introduce me to somebody that they know, I, they're typically much more receptive to talking to me and, and developing a relationship than kind of a, a cold call or a cold email. I try to make my emails warm, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I also wonder if there might be ways if we identify some groups to sort of go and meet them at current places where they're already meeting instead of inviting them to mm -hmm. come to things that we're doing um, and just, you know, listen and maybe have like a five minute like, hey, this is what we're doing. And um, so I don't know if there's if you know if people know of um, those kinds of meetings mm -hmm. that are happening or we can just reach out and ask people. But um, yeah, that might be another like thinking about how do we actually how do we engage with people and like is a zoom meeting how you know is that going to work or not. Um, right. Maybe there's other strategies that would work better or, or something so Another group that comes to mind when I, when you start talking about resilience and resiliency is the Idaho resilience project which Jean Muchy has been the driving force with so I don't know if you know Jean or if you want an introduction maybe having her um, might be a good one I can facilitate that thank you I have I have looked into them I have not connected with them yet but absolutely and they're focused more on the adverse childhood trauma yep and Jean also serves as on um, community on the city council of Nampa now so okay. she has policy as well. She may be a really great addition to this. But yeah, ACEs adverse childhood experiences and trauma and effects. Yeah. Long-term trauma. Mm -hmm. The cities is, is, an also, is another group that I haven't fully engaged. So in our proposal, certainly we have the city of Boise, we have Meridian and Caldwell representation from those three cities. And I know there's a group that I, I've been meaning to reach out to and haven't quite yet that brings together representation from all the cities. And Matt, do you know what they're called? I, I yeah, don't. the Idaho Association of Cities. The executive director is well, Kelly Parker. She'd be great. She'd yeah, be great so I work with the Idaho Association of Cities, but there's something specific to the Treasure Valley. The Valley. Yeah. I think it's called the Treasure Valley Collaborative, and yeah, very few people know, hard to get access to it. I've never been invited to a meeting. I think it's kind of a private, only the mayors that are wanting to work together actually go to and their staff. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost easier to just reach out to all the individual mayor's office individually than to the Treasure Valley Collaborative. Okay. That's my experience as well. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't tried to infiltrate that group just yet. <laughs> it is, it, I've, I've not quite figured it out. And when I first started here at the chamber, I was trying to figure it out and I've since given up. That's good to know. That's good to know. Okay. Great. This is very useful. Thank you. So just looking at our questions, we only have a couple minutes left. So I guess, so the first question, we are proposing convergence research. I have no doubt. And we are working very hard to create an interdisciplinary research team and, and research efforts. We, we still have, I think, a lot of work to do to bring a more representative group to the table, 
And this conversation has really helped to identify some of those groups that are missing. So I really appreciate that. And as you go on through your days, and if you think of somebody else that we should connect with, you know, please feel free to send Carson and I an email and we will reach out to them or you can introduce us directly. And that's, that's a great way to, to connect. And yeah, does anybody have any other, and I guess one more thought, just when thinking about this, ability to produce something that's truly transdisciplinary. I think if we are able to find a way to use this tool to actually promote change, to address some of those underlying stresses, not within a specific place, but across jurisdictional boundaries, that's, I think, when we would reach that level. And so I think bringing in some more policy folks to help us understand that landscape and how to speak to those groups and share results and, and translate them into something that's truly meaningful and useful is, is something that we should really work hard toward. I was, I'm just gonna share a podcast that I just listened to that's called How to Design for Social Impact, Four Tips for Complex Challenges. Um, and it's through from IDEO, they're a group that does human-centered design, which is some terminology if you're not familiar with it, but it's basically kind of inverting how you design and thinking about the people first and then working backward. Um, and so it's it's really good lesson. Um, and I think it has a lot of relevance, even though the person who ta is talking is doing a lot of work in Africa, I think there's a lot of um, relevance for the work that we're doing. So it's a, yeah. it's a good one. Great, thanks Carson. Yeah. I'll, I'll plug it in for my next round. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, everybody. The, the next paper I just had it pulled up is where to go. Assessing the relationship between social vulnerability and community resilience to hazards. So I kind of like, and I'm going to put this out to everybody. Nobody has to volunteer today, but I would love to rotate through facilitators so that you know, so if somebody else wants to do what I did today, where you just break down those five, the, the, the purpose of the paper, the importance, the methods, the major findings, and again, coming back to those big picture implications, um, and then leading kind of the discussion, we'll hopefully rotate through, through on that. But yeah, so all of the papers, everybody has access to that drive, okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Any final comments for the day? Cool. This was good. Always more learning. It's good. Yeah, great. Thanks everybody for being here. Appreciate it. I know everybody, so it's inspiring to me that you made time and you know, to engage today. So thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Have a great rest of your Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Greg, I have a random question for you. Yeah. Do you do you have a dog, and do you go to the corrals hiking trail? Do I what? Have you, do you hike on the corrals hiking trail? Um, where is the corrals? Corrals is up Bogus Basin Road. I swore I saw you one day and then I got too shy to call out your name. <laughs> like, maybe it's not great. But I was like in a mask and glasses and so, you know, you, I was not. Stalker. <laughs> it probably wasn't me. I don't usually get to the north end up there, okay. north it end of town. Like two months ago, but. I thought it was and I have funny because you meet people dogs. on Zoom and who never met in person. So Right. Yeah. Well keep your eyes peeled, I'll do the same. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Bye everybody. Okay. Do we need any follow up or are we good? I just wanted to ask, um, I haven't met you, Carson, but from yeah, what I know at, um, looks like you're gonna be an integral part too. If you could kind of tell me your role real quick, uh, if you have a couple minutes. Yeah, just in, in, in general or for this project or? Yeah, both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so um, so I'm, this is my fourth year in my PhD project. Um, I'm working with Brittany and um, yeah, and we sort of started the Hazard and Climate Resilience Institute together when it wasn't called an institute. Um, and then I've been working with her to um, sort of just build it out and, um, engage with people and my research is really focused on trying to 
communicate about natural hazards in a way that motivates people to prepare. And so I'm doing, my background's in geosciences, but then now I've kind of shifted more into the social sciences, doing more survey style of research. And, um, and my main sort of <clears throat> motivations going forward is uh, just really trying to do applied research and research that's helping communities. And, and so that's kind of the motivation for creating this institute is working on these real, real challenges um, using all the resources we have at the university. So, um, so yeah, I'm, my role is kind of like ever changing and lots of different hats, um, but I'm, yeah, I'll, I'm happy to kind of meet with you and more and I'll be curious to know more about kind of your plan and your interests too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know I, I had reached out to Brittany to see if we could meet, but I guess you were very confined to, <laughs> your house right now but uh, yeah if you would want to meet up in like the quad or something we could throw on our masks and I think that would be really helpful to meet and talk about um, the project and uh, my interest in everything too so maybe I can get your contact information. yeah I'll just put my number in the chat okay perfect yeah so Carson Carolyn's working with Sale and I on the resilience equity awesome aspect of the work. And so Carolyn, there we'll, we'll talk more on Friday, of course. I'm sorry for shuffling the time. Hopefully my daughter sleeps. Sometimes she doesn't nap. But anyway, uh, what was I going to say? Lost, totally lost some train of thought. Um, a lot of the work that we're doing with this grant, I think will could serve as a strong foundation for some of the work that you're going to tackle. Right. Right, so I would love for you to be a part of this in whatever capacity we can integrate it into your work because it's, if nothing else, it's going to be a really important learning experience. And if you are looking at resilience equity with the Treasure Valley as your study area, then this is going to provide you a ton of data. So right, yeah. It's, if it's funded, it's only, I don't know how much you know about the Civic program, but it's only a one year project. So yeah, that's what I was reading about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the if we get and I was rereading the proposal today, and I'm telling you what, that's a good proposal. I don't mean to like pat ourselves on the back, but that's like a really good proposal. <laughs> <laughs> that is. It's just it's I think it's so strong, and so I would be really surprised if we don't at least get the planning grant funded. You know, hopefully, and I think we have a good chance if we really build out that you know use this time to train ourselves and the research and build out a project that has that potential for a transdisciplinary impact, then we have got a really good chance of getting funded. So the planning grant, if it's funded, we would get the funding probably around November or here around then. I don't know, it's hard to say. And then the full proposal is due in March. But the project itself is a one-year accelerated project. Uh, it'd be way better if we had three years, but it is a one yeah. year. And so we would collect a ton of data in, in the year of September 2021 to August 2022. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I guess um, I can save my rest of my questions for uh, Friday when, when the three of us meet. So, but yeah, this was really helpful. Thank you Thanks. for including yeah. me. Yeah, of course. I'm glad that you're what, what is your, what's your background a little bit, just because I haven't heard it right. about you. Um, yeah, public administration. Yeah, I did my master's in public administration. And I worked at the city government as a budget analyst for a year and um, also Mercer, some a private uh, company as well. And yeah, I'm doing public policy and administration. And like Brittany mentioned, I'm interested in equitable resilience, hopefully doing a dissertation in that realm. I'm not sure exactly what I haven't pinpointed. Um, the gap of knowledge yet, but that's mm -hmm. very fascinating. And I'm sure something will come together. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm excited to, to dive in and learn more. So mm -hmm. cool. And I, I would echo that. Profile yet for the for our website, HCRI website? Uh, no, I should know that was a thing. Well, anyways, Bernie can tell you about it later. It's not pressing, but yeah, we will. Definitely. Also, Carolyn, one thing that Carson and I have done but not have not yet had a chance to analyze and this I, I talked to Sally about this and we'll talk about it on Friday but just since we're all three in this talk in this conversation now and let you know but we did a campus survey and uh, so we did two campus surveys one 
pre-COVID, which was more of a natural hazard perception and attitudes. And so we were integrating that protective action decision model framework that we've talked about a little bit, where if you want somebody to, to change their behavior, to promote pre preparedness or mitigation pre-event, pre-disaster, then you need to help them personalize the risk and develop positive attitudes toward taking that action. And so we basically did a, a study, a survey across the campus population that looked at people's perceptions and attitudes and level of preparedness so far. And, and um, we are working to analyze that. It was something that I really tried and hoped to do this summer, but it's just kept, it just, it's just too much. So that's a data set that's just sitting there ready to be analyzed. Yeah. That's it's a good opportunity for, for you to, um, maybe get started on something if you wanted to tackle that. And then we also did a second survey in, when did we do that one person? April, March, May? It was in May, it was right at the end of the semester, post COVID or sin COVID, I guess. And so in that one, we, in the first one, we focused really strongly on, on weather related hazards. And the second one, we, we were focused on COVID and a little bit on the earthquake, you know, did experiencing an earthquake change your any of your perceptions. But, it was very strongly focused on COVID. And so those are two data sets that we just have sitting there waiting, ready to be analyzed. And Carson, Carolyn didn't mention, but she also has an undergraduate degree in math. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's awesome. How do I access those or there? Uh... We can add you to the, yeah. the project or, yeah. Okay, cool. It's on, yeah. it's via Qualtrics. I don't know if you've used oh. Qualtrics or familiar yeah. with it. But... Yeah, for sure. And I did start on the data, we cleaning up the first survey and didn't get very far because because you have a million things going on. Excuse, excuse, excuse. But uh, do you know SPSS? Have you used that software? Uh, no, we uh, used R Studio in my graduate program, but sure. you could you could continue to use R. I think it's it would do just as well. Um, yeah. So maybe we'll schedule another meeting to go through those, but we'll talk okay. about play on Friday. We'll kind of get things started in terms of our, our relationship and yeah, no, that'd be great. Um, and then maybe we can schedule a meeting with, with me and Carson in the next okay. couple of weeks to, to take a look at that data and, and think about, look at the research questions that we came up with and, and think about how the questions that we pose could address those questions and hypotheses and then make a plan for analysis. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. Alrighty. Cool. Great. All right, guys. Thank you. Step off. Thank you both so much. Yeah. Have a great day. All right. Yeah, thanks. You too, Carolyn. Bye.